Thank you, Dr. Dr. Roni. Um, a couple of questions for you. Um, one, uh, you know, as people get older, their eyesight tends to go a little bit, and you know, people who eat plant based diets tend to think that they're you know somehow immune to various things. You mentioned a bunch of symptoms, but what about what about deteriorating eyesight? Is that just a normal occurrence of of age? Is that um, an issue? You know, is that a sign of an issue? Can uh, eating a whole food plant based diet minimize the, the the loss of vision that people often see as they age? So uh, first of all, I just want to um, say that not everyone experiences age related sure. vision loss. Um, there are some things that happen as we get older. For example, most people will develop presbyopia. Presbyopia is difficulty reading up close where our lens can't accommodate as well as it used to. The lens is simply not as flexible. So both um, people who are, um, are on a plant-based diet as well as those who are not will develop presbyopia. So that's irrespective of, of uh, dietary choices. There are other things though, for example, cataracts, I mentioned earlier, uh, macular degeneration, in which um, the diet diet can make a difference. So there are studies in limited studies. There haven't been that many large scale population studies in, in the ophthalmology space with respect to diet, but there are some studies that show that uh, populations that have higher intakes of fruits and vegetables, at least uh, three to four servings a day of fruits and vegetables have a lower risk of developing cataract. Now, that being said, if one lives long enough, everyone will develop a cataract. But uh, the question is, you know, when does it become symptomatic? And it's possible that by including more plants in one's diet, uh, that can delay the uh, development of a symptomatic cataract. And in terms of macular degeneration, the same. Um, there are some larger studies uh, in macular degeneration. For example, uh, there's the largest study that was done looked at over 100,000 individuals and followed them over 26 years. And um, that study definitely showed that um, individuals who are on a plant-rich diet, a plant-forward diet, had about 40, 43% reduction in um, advanced macular degeneration and progression. And how about uh, sun, going out in the sun for eye health? Is, is the sun something that we need to wear sunglasses to protect ourselves from? Is the sun something that we need? Uh, you know, there's, there's talk about... Um, it being a good idea to go out for early morning sun um, for, to reset your circadian rhythm, to have healthy sleep cycles, but then you're going out in the sun and you're, you're, and you're getting sunlight into your eyes. Is that damaging? Is that good for us? Yeah. So the sun emits various different wavelengths of light. Um, it emits UV light, which uh, is typically the, the, the rays that get into our eyes are UVA and UVB rays. And these rays can be associated with a myriad of ocular problems. Um, uh, for example, growths on the surface of the eye that are either benign or malignant. Um, excessive UV exposure can lead to burns on the cornea, burns in the retina, and also increase the risk of cataracts and macular degeneration. So it is my belief that we should be protecting our eyes from the sun. Um, and I typically recommend that um, one should wear UV blocking sunglasses between the hours of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. when the sun is highest in the sky at its zenith in the sky. Um, now, outside of that, uh, you know, whether early morning sun is beneficial, well, yes, there are, you know, there is, um, there are benefits. Uh, so that primarily the benefits come from blue light that, that also gets emitted by the sun. Now, blue light is if you think about the rainbow of colors, blue light is on the shorter end of the wavelength of the rainbow. Um, and these rays are uh, unique because these wavelengths are picked up by certain cells in the retina that could then communicate to the brain, uh, to the pineal gland that helps us set our circadian rhythm. So yes, early morning blue light exposure is beneficial to set our circadian rhythm. And also late night blue light exposure can potentially offset our circadian rhythm, making it harder to fall asleep or stay asleep. Now, with respect to going out early in the early morning and getting that, that sunlight, um, what I typically recommend is don't look directly at the sun or stare directly at the sun. Now, we probably all have heard this, you know, at, you know after, with the recent eclipse, you know, don't look at the sun directly, wear your eclipse glasses. Well, the same is true even without an eclipse. It's not a it's not um it's not a good idea to stare directly at the sun because those rays are so powerful. So I would say if you want to go and get that blue light exposure in the morning, 
Um, do it with your eyelids closed so you can face the sun with your eyelids closed and those rays will still get in and still stimulate your um, circadian rhythm. So that's my typical recommendation. So the eyelids actually do protect you from the, the rays or, or uh, they, do they block the rays or they minimize the rays? Is that what A lot of the it? rays, uh, the potentially harmful short wavelength rays can get absorbed by the lids. Now, of course, that may put you at risk for eyelid cancers, but um, but if you do it super early morning, you're not doing it between the hours of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., it should be okay. And I also I don't recommend doing it for 20 minutes, an hour, two hours. I know some people do do that as part of their morning routine, uh, spending quite a bit of time looking at the sun. So if you if you do do um, early morning uh, sun gazing, I would recommend limiting it to um, anywhere from three to four minutes at the most, again, with the eyelids closed. Okay, eyelids closed. All right. And um, you mentioned blue light. Um, how does environmental exposure such as screen time and blue light affect eye health? And what preventative measures do you recommend? Yeah, so the good news is there is no real long-term consequence of too much blue light exposure. You know, there was some there were some um, articles that were published about five six years ago that created a lot of fear in the media um, that was propagated by the media saying, "Oh, blue light exposure will kill your retina cells and cause you to go blind." Well, that's not true. And if that were really true, we would have an epidemic of vision loss right now. Um, but what is true is that the blue light that comes from our screens, that comes from our all of our devices, our television sets. Blue light also comes from the energy saving bulbs that we, we tend to use, CFL bulbs, LED bulbs. They all limit blue light. So that artificial blue light can cause short-term issues and um, ca can may cause symptoms like eye strain, light sensitivity, headaches, eye fatigue, blurry vision. So these symptoms we typically call um, digital eye strain. It's kind of an umbrella term that we use for all of these symptoms associated with blue light. Luckily, they're short-term issues, not long-term issues. So again, you know, we are we are, are we are in a digital age. So it's inevitable that we're going to be on screens. We can't avoid it at the, in this day and age. But you know, the good thing is you have to realize, okay. When should I modulate my screen time, particularly as the evening goes on? After the sun sets, our eyes are not supposed to be exposed to all of this artificial blue light, and it may interfere with our sleep patterns. So you may want to get bulbs that are smart bulbs, so they change their color tone after the sun sets. You may want to put an app on your device that will automatically reduce the blue light coming from your screen after the sun has set in your geographic location and allow for... Uh, more of a, a reddish kind of a warm tone to your screen that um, that is probably better for sleep. So you can do things like that. There are ways to modulate that. And when should we avoid, at what, what, what point in the evening should we avoid, uh, you know, a lot of light exposure so that we don't mess up our, our sleep? Typically two hours before bedtime. And again, I know it's very challenging for many of us, myself included. You know, I tend to do some of my best work in the evening and I'm on my screens, but, you know, we do what we have to do. But if you if you take the precautions, like I said, uh, maybe install the screen filter app. There's one that I really, um, I really like. It's called Iris, um, iristech.co, and you can download it. Um, and, you know, there's also the question of whether people should be wearing blue light glasses or not. And I do want to address that uh, briefly because I know a lot of uh, you know, companies market these blue blocking glasses. The truth is not all blue blockers are made the same. Uh, some of them look very light in color. Like for example, they are clear or they have a very light yellowish tint. Now those blue blockers really don't do very much. And um, they only block about anywhere from 10 to 30% of the blue light. And the way you know is you can put the glasses on, look at your screen, look at something that's blue on your screen. If you can still see the color blue, it's not blocking all of the blue light. Um, versus if you get a blue blocker that is a deeper tint, for example, a deep red, deep orange, amber, if you put those blue blockers on and you look at your screen, you will not be able to see any blue whatsoever. So my recommendation is if you want to get blue blocking glasses, especially for nighttime screen use, get the really deep tint because then at least you know it's blocking about 98 to 99% of the blue light at that, at that time. Great. Thank you. Dr. Tullifson, Michael Greger um, has done some videos on ginger for helping uh, PMS symptoms, particularly cramping. What, what are your thoughts on ginger? Do you know anything about that? 
Ginger and PMS. I, that's a good question. Um, I'm not thinking of any studies, but I'm sure I, I love Dr. Greger. Um, and I'm sure that if he highlighted some studies, I'm sure that they are there. There's some interesting, um, there's some interesting research on PMS. There was a study done where they looked at um, nurses and they had them um, for two months. They just had them or they randomized them into half were in the control diet and half were in a whole grain. And so they just wanted them to replace their uh, the grains that they were doing with whole grains. And so the intervention group that just went from their um, ultra process to their whole grains had a significant decrease in general mood, physical and behavioral PMS symptoms. Um, there's also uh, there's also some research, um, again, on the nurses health study, case control study, where they saw that after 10 years, that um, the women who had the highest quintile of non-heme dietary iron, so the highest intake of plant-based iron, um, had a relative risk of PMS of 0 0.64. So there's some interesting research there. And then we know, like, just like anything that has to do with pain, we know that PMS, like pain-promoting foods, are often those that are in um, their lower quality. So lots of added fat, sugar, salt are associated with an increase in symptoms. Um, so ginger, ginger is anti-inflammatory. I know it's good for many different things. I don't know the, the ginger literature, but I look forward to, to listening to Dr. Greger's video and, and learning more. Right. Great. Yes. Yeah, it's it's uh, some interesting stuff. So uh, we were talking a little bit about breast cancer earlier and we talked about reducing the risk of breast cancer. What about reoccurrence uh, of, mm -hmm. of breast cancer? What, what are measures that, uh, that women can do to uh, reduce the risk of a recurrence yeah. So the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund recommend after a cancer diagnosis to follow those same recommendations that I shared earlier. So a high fiber diet, um, you know, uh, eating the rainbow, lots of different phytonutrients. Um, so, so yeah, so high in fiber. Um, as far as as far as decreasing the risk of recurrence, a healthy diet is part of it. Um, also, it's important to maintain a healthy weight, which can be an extra challenge, especially for women who have gone through chemotherapy. Uh, but maintaining a healthy weight and then being physically active, the research around. Um, physical activity for breast cancer survivors is really powerful too. And of course, we want to do things that decrease the risk of recurrence. But what they found is that eating a, um, a healthy diet, eating a real nourishing diet, whole food, plant predominant, plant forward diet, um, that it also improves quality of life and helps with many of the symptoms that women who are breast cancer survivors deal with, such as decreased energy, such as anxiety, um, fatigue. So many of those, those different symptoms, aches and pains, many women are on like an aromatase inhibitor or endocrine therapy afterwards, which can lead to some additional aches and pains or just going through menopause. So in addition to a healthy diet, like one um, recommended by the American Institute for Cancer Research, being good for decreasing the risk of recurrence um, and getting that physical activity in too. Also, they help with quality of life, which I think is is so important for cancer survivors. So, um, so some doctors uh, um, are critical about uh, mammograms, such as Dr. Jen Simmons. Um, and specifically for discomfort risks and inaccuracies leading to unnecessary procedures and radiation exposure. And she advocates for QT imaging, uh, which is a revolutionary non-invasive breast cancer screening technology that supposedly offers a safe, more, uh, uh, more accurate and comfortable alternative without compression, especially effective for dense breasts. Um, what do you recommend instead of mammograms or do you think mammograms are okay? So I recommend mammograms. I um, follow as an as an obstetrician gynecologist. I'm part of the American College of OB gyns, um, and so I follow just the general recommendations. I'm not aware of of that um, physician or her recommendations, and I'm also not an oncologist. Um, but I do. I'm I'm here because a mammogram caught my uh, my breast cancer, and so obviously, um, you know. But even the data show us that mammograms have benefit. There is debate over how often you get um, screening. I recommend that women typically have mammograms every year, just the general recommendation by American College of ob -GYNs starting around age 40. But really, I think that it's important to have a discussion with one's physician to talk about risks and benefits. If somebody has a higher risk, maybe starting earlier, somebody has um, extra dense breasts, if there are certain, you know, certain issues, they discuss that with their doctor and then, um, and then look into what's the best screen 
screening. So I don't have any, any, I guess, more alternative recommendations. I do know that when you screen more often, there is that risk that you find something abnormal and the fear associated with waiting for that result. I mean, that's very, that's very rare or that's very real. So that's where you get different organizations, um, Sometimes saying, you know, the frequency of a mammogram should be different. Um, I tend to, I, I believe women should have access to mammograms every year if, if they desire, um, if they desire them. And then of course, talk with your physician about risks and benefits. And as, as you go and check uh, nutritionfacts.org, Michael Gregor's website, he has a whole series on mammograms yeah. and, and breast cancer. Mm-hmm. 